at the various kinds of uh, translators or how system programs have evolved. So we have an assembler, a macroprocessor, loader, linker, compiler, and interpreter. So when you look at your assembler, okay, initially before the assemblers, that is assemblers belong to the second generation. So you can see in first generation, most of the system programmers wrote programs in machine level language and not many people were writing programs at that particular period of time. So you bas basically programmers wrote uh, in a language that was interpreted by the hardware. Those instructions were binary uh, numbers consisting of zeros and ones. Now this particular um, programs written in machine language was obviously difficult to read and write. So what was required was an easier way uh, to um, write programs. Okay, And what came about was your mnemonic uh, programs written in mnemonic language also called as the assembly language. So if you write a program in mnemonics or symbols, uh, obviously the machine does not understand the instructions. So what you require is an assembler, an assembler which will make this translation from a program written in assembly language into a program written in machine level language that the system understand. So to your uh, assembler, you will put a source program written in assembly level language and your output will be a target program that is uh, present in uh, machine level language. Now your assembler, okay, when we had an assembler, it would basically take a source program and it would convert it into the target program. Okay, this target program happen to be your object code. Okay. Now this object code need to be placed in memory and the execution of that program should take place. Right. So one way to put this object code into memory was the assembler itself does this function. The assembler would take the object code it has produced and load it into that particular memory. Okay. But to do this action, the assembler should itself be placed in the memory. The assembler should occupy some space in the memory. This scheme works, but there are two problems with this scheme. One is that your assembler is occupying space. So it basically wastes space in memory. Because the amount of space occupied by an assembler is huge. And the second problem is, whenever this program needs to be executed, the assembler should perform retranslation. That is, irrespective of whether you change lines in your program, every time this program has to be run, it should be reassembled by your assembler. And then this assembler would load the program into the main memory and control would be transferred to the starting location of the program where execution should uh, take place. So what was required was or what system programmers uh, wanted was a program that places this uh, object code that is generated by the assembler into memory such that the amount of space occupied by that particular software is small. Okay, This is where your loader comes into picture. So the definition of the loaders is it is basically a system software which places the object program into memory and uh, prepares the program for execution. The advantage of an, a loader over an assembler is that it does not waste memory space and retranslation of that object code is not required. That is whatever object code the assembler gives, that object code is placed into memory by the loader and execution is started. Now this is a very simple loading scheme. That is whatever object code is produced by the assembler, it is placed into memory uh, by the loader and it, the execution starts. Okay. Now, the, what happened was when assemblers, uh, assembly level language programs came into picture, many people started writing programs. And when uh, high level languages came into uh, picture, may, many more people started taking to writing programs. 
So what was observed was that many users were writing similar programs. So the point was, ki why should everyone write similar programs? So when this uh, question was asked, uh, the concept of ready-made programs or uh, packages were uh, brought into picture. That is, where uh, the user is basically going to uh, use somebody else's instruction code written in his program so that his program can accomplish that particular uh, task. Now these uh, instructions, that is these lines of codes that were written so that others can use in order to perform a, a task is called as your subroutine. Okay? There are basically two kinds of subroutines, that is an open subroutine and a closed subroutine. Now when you say an open subroutine, this subroutine is basically a part of the main memory itself. So it is like something like a macro substitution. Wherever there is a macro call, it would be substituted by its definition. These are open subroutines, subroutines which are basically part of your main program. And the other part happens to be the, or the other one happens to be the closed subroutine. In closed subroutines, these subroutines do not belong up to be, a, they are not part of the main memory. They are basically outside the main memory. So, if you want to include such a subroutine in your program, what was required was the uh, program should have the capability to transfer the control to that particular subroutine which accomplishes a particular task. So you should not only transfer control to that subroutine, but also should be able to transfer the data. Now, let us consider a subroutine SQRT X. Okay, this basically happens to be a closed subroutine. It is a closed subroutine. So if there is a programmer and he wishes to include this particular subroutine SQRT of X which calculates the square root of uh, a value, okay, so he has to have uh, instructions written such that the, there is transfer of control to this subroutine SQRT where it would calculate the square root of the given value and whatever data is obtained that is returned back to the calling or the uh, main program. Okay, So if to more than one programmer wish to have the subroutine SQRT of X, he or she can do so. So for example, let's say there are two programmers and both of them have included or made a call to this subroutine SQRT of X. Okay, Now let's see how this SQRT or this subroutine will be placed in memory for both the programmers. So if I say this is programmer 1 and this happens to be uh, the programmer 2, fine, uh, both the programmers would have to produce and uh, the assembler for both the programmers would produce the object code of the main program and also the code uh, object code for the subroutine SQRT of X. Okay. Now, in the earlier days, the user itself had to specify the location of this subroutine in the memory. So, say it occupied this location. Okay. For a programmer one, similarly, it would occupy the same location for programmer two. Okay. Now, the object code given by your assembler will now be loaded into the main memory by the loader. Say it is placed over here. Program 1's object code. Okay. And the similarly, the assembler would produce an object code for uh, the program written by the second programmer. And it would be loaded into memory by the loader and say it occupies this space program to object code. Now if you look here, this basically has created a hole here. That is, there is a hole created in the memory space. Probably you would not be able to use or allocate this memory space to any other program. So there is no proper utilization of memory space. But still 
if we were to execute this program, it would work. That is, this program would contain an instruction which would automatically transfer the control to the subroutine SQRT. It would calculate uh, for the, the square root of whatever value has been passed. And once uh, it has calculated, it would return the value and control back to the object program of program 1. Now, but if you look at this scheme, we see that the program 2, the object code of program 2 has occupied some space of the subroutine SQRT. This is because we have to specify the address location where SQRT had to be placed. And what has happened here is pro the object code of program 2 has occupied certain space of the subroutine uh, square root. So this square root function would not behave appropriately. So what system programmers felt was ki the loader not only does the job of loading the program but also relocated this subroutine or they wanted the loader to, to place the subroutine or the object code of the subroutine following the uh, object code of the program so that such situations like where there is no proper utilization of memory space or your object code is overwriting certain parts of your subroutines can be avoided. So we have loaders which perform this job and they are called as relocating loaders.